Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we'll talk about the need to keep following the Middle East. Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandakar, political analyst, geopolitical analyst. So what are we going to discuss today? We're going to discuss the situation in the Middle East and specifically with regard to Israel. So many things have happened uh, since October 7th, almost two years ago, and we need to follow them because I'm not sure people are following them. We need to understand what is happening in Israel and with all the players and streams of events that are taking place around this war. And uh, Rupmati Kandakar, welcome, welcome to the show. I am so happy to have you here uh, to help us understand. Uh, we're going on for two years now, so many threads, so many events. Let me ask you one question first. What about the hostages? You know, there are still, hundreds of them are still in murderous captivity. It must be awful. It must be agony for them to be there that long. What is the status of the hostages? And what are your thoughts about that? Aloha, Jay. And thank you for having me on your show. And it's, like you said, two years, day 284. So still the relevant question and still the looming question is, what about the hostages? And Jay, you are concerned and human enough to ask these questions. I'm concerned, where is the media? Why aren't they putting this on the front pages? And uh, Where are the hostages? Uh, this should be the right headlines for every newspaper every day till each one of them is released. They are Israelis, they are human citizens, they have been kidnapped from their own homes and still they lie after two years in... Um, captivity, uh, under pressure, uh, the psychological effect, the physical damage that they are going through is a phenomenal, Jay. We can't even sustain, uh, say, a few days in a closed, compatible environment. Imagine them being in a hostile environment. And uh, just, I think, a few hours back, they released a picture of uh, four females, uh, female hostages. Um, uh, a few years back, they said, a couple of years back, They've just released the picture. Now imagine the agony of the families whose uh, um, children these are or whose members these are. So that is all being brushed under the carpet and uh, nobody is ready to put this into the mainstream. And until Jay, each and every one wakes up, this kind of situation will continue forever and ever in ev this is giving them the uh, terrorists uh, upper hand. And uh, Jay, we know a hostage situation in Israel is the um, blackmailing point for Benjamin Netanyahu, which they hold him uh, uh, to task. The, the domestic uh, population always puts pressure on Netanyahu before he starts any war offensive. He has to always answer about... Um, what is happening to the hostages, but we know what kind of enemy he's dealing with. He's dealing with the enemy which has guerrilla tactics, which has, uh, which has support from six antagonistic nations. So this kind of uh, environment that he's uh, facing is difficult for him to bring the hostage situation under his control. It's completely out of his hands. And we know any dealing that happens with Israel always has Israel on the back foot because of hostages. And that is the very reason why Hamas first, as soon as they entered on October 7th, they picked up hostages. This was their uh, uh, cutthroat uh, strategy. This, this was their uh, strangling point for Israel to keep the hostages with themselves and then negotiate. So, uh, Jay, uh, there, there has been an Israeli hostage ceasefire framework which has been made public by Netanyahu uh, on, which was made May 27th and now July uh, 6th, 16th it was released. Uh, at 6th, 6th it was released. And this is uh, a three-stage um, framework that he set up. It is first stage will take 42 days which in which there will be a temporary secession of all military violence, of all military activities. There'll be withdrawal of troops from Gaza. There'll be an increased uh, uh, aid uh, outlet inlet 
there'll be uh, uh, un agencies which will be allowed to come in and there'll be a uh, um, what is the rehabilitation of infrastructure this will be the first 42 days the next second stage will be the next 42 days in which there will be a sustainable calm which has to be exercised and um, and the third stage is the next uh, the remaining 42 days in which there will be um, an exchange of the remaining hostages the reconstruction of gaza strip in 3 to 5 years and the opening of the um, channel so there is a open transfer of uh, persons and goods so j you see what is israel aiming for permanent ceasefire withdrawal of uh, troops from gaza reconstruction of gaza opening of the borders so and in exchange of what hostages will be in, uh, released and um, prisoners palestine prisoners who have been in israeli jails will be released and the ratio as we know will always be higher 3 to 1 5 to 1 um, and make no mistake these prisoners are not kept not hostages not private citizens they have the ones who have committed crimes against israelis and they are uh, offenders who will come back who will again gear up to hurt so this is the kind of uh, uh, platform that israel is negotiating with for the hostages how does it look does it look like it's going to get done i mean it sounds to me like a really good deal for hamas um, I'm not sure it includes the elimination of Hamas. Uh, now, J.D. Vance was designated only yesterday as the vice presidential candidate under Trump, and his position has been, and you have to assume that that's Trump's position too, is uh, we, we, the United States, we have to let Israel, quote, finish the job, end quote. And that means finish the war, and that means eliminate Hamas. But yes. the uh, the terms you just described don't necessarily include the elimination of Hamas. So where does Hamas stand if if it accepts these terms? They are very uh, rigid in their negotiation. They keep it, the ceasefire is just up to the point that they can rehabilitate, they can regroup and they can re-strengthen their forces. Around 67 to 70% of Hamas troops are still intact and their recruitment is on a uh, upward trend. Since October 7, it has not declined. Their forces have not declined. In fact, say the Iron Dome costs one million to maintain. For them, it is recruiters who will come up with a sheer zeal in their heart and antagonism for Israel that they will come and recruit themselves. So, see, the stakes are very different on both the sides. Israel has to go through monetary, through uh, domestic pressure to re-strengthen. For them, it has to just be one fiery speech or one dead body that they will parade around the streets and you will have 20 recruits who will be ready to lay down their life. So this kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, imbalance, asymmetric warfare like you have always said, it's this which is hurting Israel. And uh, an ideological defeat because uh, J. Um, 67% of Palestinians in Gaza still support uh, uh, Hamas, irrespective of the fact that they are terrorists, uh, whatever. They don't, they don't have a sympathetic um, uh, inclination towards Israel. They have never spoken of the terror attack on Israel. It's always the Middle East conflict. This is what hurts Jay. And uh, there is no clear-cut black and white here. They're all making a gray zone and fiddling around in that gray zone. And that makes things very difficult for Israel to sustain on day, on uh, two years onwards into this war when they are still regrouping. Hezbollah is getting stronger. Hezbollah is sending their troops. Uh, Hezbollah keeps on firing missiles. Have the missiles stopped? Has there been a ceasefire from their end? No, because for them, they are enjoying this. They, it's become their routine life. Absolutely routine life, there, etc. What is what is disturbed? The Israeli normalcy of life is disturbed. For them, it's not a disturbance. For them, it's just part of life. That is dangerous to Well, it doesn't sound like um, you know a, a ceasefire uh, necessarily resolves the problem because 
you still have uh, Hezbollah, you still have Iran controlling Hezbollah, you still have Iran controlling the Houthis in Yemen, uh, which we haven't heard too much about them, but uh, they're still there. Um, and there will be more from them when they decide that uh, they want to do that. Um, you have South Africa, which is a slightly anti-Semitic, uh, which is uh, seeking uh, sanctions, uh, uh, war crime determination against Israel in the International Court of Justice. And that, I don't know what happened to that, but that was all the news a couple, three months ago. Um, and so you have all these threads of attacks against Israel. And, and at the same moment, you know, Rupmati, this has got to be um, a very difficult time for the Israeli economy. It has virtually hundreds of thousands of young people in uniform. They're not necessarily working. Uh, the economy must be taking a terrible hit. Um, I don't know how they can survive for any length of time. In two years, the economy has been visibly hobbled. Um, so, you know, this, it's a war of attrition in many ways. And, and even if there is a, a peace settlement for now, uh, all of these, um, these, these anti-Israel elements, anti-Zionist elements will continue to attack Israel. Uh, personally, on the, on the streets of, uh, of the West Bank, as we've seen uh, just a day or two ago, um, and, and the campuses of the United States and, and Europe, um, and uh, the Palestinian protests will continue, and politicians will be afraid of helping Israel and so forth. So I guess uh, my question is, uh, these threads, will they be mollified in some way? Uh, will, will they become more peaceful in some way if there is a settlement? You brought up such a valid point about economics. Uh, India and China, huge economies, huge uh, markets, but they refuse to go to war, full-fledged war, because of disturbance to the economies. Now, Israel is facing this disturbance on the, a terrorist attack and then a post-terrorist uh, uh, retaliation with the entire offensive of the world media, of uh, elements who are... Uh, anti-Zionist, uh, they 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 will all attack Israel like Israel is the offender rather than the victim. So uh, and Jay, we have we've also had a show which has spoken of how they want the elections to be taking place in this entire chaos. So they expect Israel to act normal in this kind of a situation. So that is so unfair. And uh, Jay, they keep on continuing uh, this kind of offensive. And a full-fledged offensive never has had any economic flourish, isn't it? So uh, what are they talking about? What are they asking from Israel? Uh, a war would just war is just devastating Israel actually. And how they're sustaining is sheer willpower, uh, support from allies. But uh, you see, we had four countries who went on and started now recognizing Palestine, where's Palestine? What is what is this kind of, uh, you know, just niggling uh, Israel for the sake of it? These disturbances when you're in offense, war offensive, uh, are disturbing, Jay. Uh, they don't allow Israel a full-fledged defense of their territory. Well, let's talk about that. There's a parallel between um, Joe Biden's moves uh, with Israel and Joe Biden's moves with uh, Ukraine. Um, so he was criticized, Joe Biden, and he can ill afford criticism right now because Trump is on a roll after the attempted assassination. But he yes. was criticized for, for saying that uh, the United States is uh, providing weapons um, to Israel. Um, and uh, they, they criticized him. Um, oh, and then he said that those were only defensive weapons. Well, really, I mean, it, what's the difference, honestly, when you're talking about a, a sliver of a state, a, a, a tiny speck of a state in the huge Middle East with all these um, countries around that would like to see Israel destroyed. Um, so he made some statement about the weapons and he got criticized by CNN and other statements he's made. And so they try to paint him um, as somebody not telling the truth. On, on, you know, on top of all his other troubles and his, you know, frailty and age problems and, and the mistakes he makes when he makes a speech and so forth. 
Um, he's not doing well politically. But okay. query, you know, how well has the United States done in supporting Israel? At first, it seemed that, you know, the United States under Biden was going to support Israel to the max. But then uh, he tried to get Netanyahu, Netanyahu to back off, and he said he was going to withhold some weapons and uh, withhold some support. And he was making demands on Israel um, with, you know, uh, to react to all of the um, uh, Hamas health ministry claims of all these yeah. people who were dying and, you know, in, in, in some sort of unfair way uh, at the hands of the Israelis. And then he brought in the, uh, the carriers. <clears throat> P.S. Rupmati, where are the carriers now? I haven't heard much about them. The media covered them as they arrived, but the media hasn't really covered them as they left. And then you have the, the dock, the dock that the United States was going to build um, to land humanitarian supplies in Gaza, bypassing all the border issues. They're going to, you know, pr provide all this humanitarian aid. But P.S., as of a few days ago, um, they pulled the dock out, said the, the, the waves were too high, uh, the water was too rough, and they took it out and moved it, and it's no longer functioning, if it ever was. So I guess my question is, uh, has Biden done a good job on supporting Israel, or is he will-o'-the-wisp uh, reacting to those kids on campus, reacting to the, the members of Congress who are complaining about his, you know, Israel's violation of you know, human rights and, you know, and its efforts to eliminate Hamas? Your thoughts? Biden has done a good job in supporting Israel. And America has stood as a steadfast ally for Israel. It is very, very clear about uh, its support. And uh, it is uh, the bond of friendship remains strong and strong because uh, Israel provides a vantage point for America. And uh, Israel relies on America as a friend. And friendship always has loyalty. So that has sustained itself. But I, I, like you said, the uh, the universities like the one survey says 51 percent of americans in the age or bracket of 18 to 24 that is the new voters jay they want uh, uh, israel should be you know they were anti-israel technically so uh, in the flow of the moments biden has gone to uh, give a voice saying that now israel should stop and give the jesus point to netanyahu to come to a negotiation and not go into Gaza. And Jay, this, this uh, war of terror that Israel faces has seen such absurd terms come into place like apartheid from South Africa, ac apartheid acquisitions from South Africa, uh, so uh, malnutrition higher than Somalia, all these things. But we never saw highest number of hostages taken from a uh, country. We never saw victims being uh, slaughtered along with the full family in their houses in the break of dawn. Oh, you never had terrorists who were in such a large scale number, 3,000 paragliders falling into your city. Where has this happened? It has never happened. Why didn't they highlight this and why didn't they speak about this? Uh, America has to uh, be more vocal, I agree, in this point that it has to be more blatant in its support for Israel, because what happened on Israeli shores is just going to either motivate or demotivate these um, extremists to do something like this in another country, another place. It's never far away. Jay. We have discussed in so many of our programs, it's never far away. Immediately after the atrocities of October 7th, um, Hamas and uh, other Iranian proxies uh, began doing a um, uh, propaganda blitz uh, all over the Middle East and all over the world. And they continue to do that. Why not? It works in their favor. Um, the world is the jury on this. And uh, they, they have sought condemnation from, um, you know, from the people who should be condemned instead. It's, a, it's a, another you know, psychological projection. You, you find that the Hamas should have been condemned, but no. The Israelis who were the victims are being condemned. And I find that remarkable, but I also find that it's still going on. This is a world, a world in which we live has social media that can reach across borders, 
that can excite students on campuses and maybe non-students on campuses all over the world and create huge protests involving 100,000 people in the streets of London. And that essentially has continued and it has drowned out whatever Israel would like to say about its condition. And so people know about that and they see all this Palestinian protest, but they don't see the reality. This is kind of the world in which we live, don't you think? And can this change? Would this change? Uh, should Israel do more of its own propaganda? Should the United, I think you've answered the question about the United States, but the United States is the function of government. And uh, should the United States, should the United States media be spending more time talking to those hostages, talking about them, talking about the Israeli economy, the Israeli issues, um, instead of just criticizing Israel. I mean, we're missing out. I mean, we, the world, are missing out on delivering a true message to, you know, the family of nations, the, the jury, so to speak, around the world who makes determinations about this. DJ, uh, you're so right about this. The, the media, the heads who are writing, who are putting paper to pen, who are putting, you know, uh, into print, they have inclinations. They don't have, they're pseudo-liberals. They don't have the aptitude and the strength of mind to say this is right, this is wrong. Today, if Israel had committed a terror attack on another country, you and I would be discussing why Israel is wrong. We have the guts to do that. But uh, some media people will never ever say that, no, Israel has been in the wrong. Israel has been offended by Palestinians. No, they will find a way to put out Palestinians as the victim, even if they were terrorists. So that is the difference in the media projections, Jay. And media projections, public memory is short. So uh, two days, three days, four days, if you read the newspaper, young minds who are in the university, and right now I can say young, ignorant minds who are in the university, when they read these newspapers, they get encouraged by their a stance. They must be getting paid also. There is a huge amount of network which is funding these university protests. That they don't understand. Uh, they should go and read about the Palestine uh, views about LGBTQ, about uh, black racism, everything. They should read about it before they support it. What would happen if they would go on the war front over there? What are Israel's views? What are the... Israel is the only democratic nation in uh, the Middle East and they are out to wipe it off the map. It is as clear a simple one line statement and you have to protect it because every human has a right to live. Israel has the Iron Dome, Jay. Iron Dome is not an offensive. It is a defense uh, mechanism for Israel. That shows how what is Israel trying to do. It's trying to protect itself. If it was offensive, it would have had missiles pointing out into Gaza Four missiles and everything would be peaceful. People forget that Israel is a democracy. And yes. if you look at the Israeli papers, um, you know, any day in, in the news websites from Israel, the news stations from Israel, you find out they don't necessarily agree on things because it's a democracy. Everybody has a First Amendment right to speak their minds. At the, at the same time, you know, um, the, the problem is this could be an existential fight by Israel. Yes. It's a small country. It's got hostile neighbors, hostile people inside Israel. There's a lot of Arabs, millions of Arabs live in Israel, you know. Um, and my concern is uh, what are the prospects for Israel? Because Israel has a kind of modesty in the way it presents the news. Uh, for example, it wasn't it, it wasn't uh, encouraging the returned hostages to speak to the media because it didn't want to hurt their families any further. Um, and I, you know, I, I really wonder where this is all going. Maybe you have an idea. Is it, how threatened is Israel by all this? The economy suffers uh, um, politically. There are arguments in the uh, war cabinet. There are arguments with Netanyahu. Um, there are arguments between the um, the, the Jewish people who are not Orthodox and those who are Orthodox. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of issues. It's a democracy. And if the United States loses this friend that you describe in Israel, what is the Middle East like then? Remember that uh, 
that Iran and most of those Arab countries around Israel don't like the US. Um, they would be all too happy to see the US influence in the Middle East disappear. Um, and they're working for that. As they attack Israel, they're attacking the, the US and the West. So my question to you is how concerned should we be about the end of Israel? And I hope there will never be an end of Israel ever. Uh... Israel is always a vantage point for not only the US, for Europe, for Asia, for each and every person who is a democracy loving citizen. Israel is a beacon of light because they are trying to survive over there. And uh, though, however, <laughs> utopian I may sound, it is very true because, uh, uh, what do you say, struggle. Struggle it never goes unrewarded. And uh, that is the, uh, this, um, main reward in this uh, entire terror uh, struggle because though there is global isolation though there is you know attempts to uh, push israel off the brink you always have something which justifies what israel is doing is right uh, the moscow attack the uh, the european attacks the european immigration problem and the more it knocks on their doorsteps jay they're going to understand what israel is going through on a daily basis the the border checks the border control it's not it's missing right now in europe when it comes into play when you have frustrations of the immigrants coming out when you have citizens in the streets being bullied or being you know taken to task just for their identity that is going to be the point where they will understand what Israel feels. And uh, Jay, uh, Israel is going to maintain itself as an island of peace amongst all this. And the defense is always going to be uh, steadfast. And they have a single aim that is very uh, noteworthy, that they do have a single aim of protecting Israel. And in this war, we have never seen that falter. They've always said the aim of the war is to put an end to Hamas, no matter where it goes. So this is the kind of determination you need when you're in a war against terror. And that I think Israel has. Mm -hmm. uh, speed breakers will come in. <laughs> One last uh, question for you, Rupmati, and, and that's this. We've alluded to the fact that Trump over his first administration um, did things that were pro-Israel, or at least in his mind, pro-Israel. He, he moved the seat of the uh, American embassy to Jerusalem. You know, he generally m made friends with um, Netanyahu, I guess, although they were not perfect friends. Um, and now his platform seems to be, as expressed through J.D. Vance, um, that the Israelis should be permitted to, quote, finish the job, end quote. He said that a number of times. I'm not sure what that means in terms of weapons or support. Uh, it could be one of those vague statements calculated to get votes uh, for Trump and um, advance. Um, but uh, my question to you is what should the winning party in this presidential election do properly? What should they do to preserve the peace in the Middle East or achieve the peace and then preserve it? in the Middle East, uh, to preserve democracy in the Middle East, um, and to, at the same time, satisfy those constituents in the United States uh, who don't feel the same way about it. Um, so I make you the Secretary of State under the next administration, Rukmati. Uh, I'm sure you do a good job. What would you do? <laughs> uh, always honored with your thoughts, Jay. Uh, the trajectory of American uh, friendship towards Israel is going to stay, uh, it's going to be consistent. Uh, technically, just because of the fact, Jay, that Israel uh, provides America with a kind of a friend who uh, would have never been there in the Middle East if Israel had not been. That kind of loyalty which we seek in a friend is only in Israel. You have people who have, uh, you, you have nations who have never proven their honesty. They have always gone back and forth. But Israel has always been uh, consistent in its policies. And uh, 
जे दो इट इज वेरी लुक्रेटिव इलेक्टोरियल इश्यू टू लर द वॉटर वॉटर्स बट इज़राइल एंड अमेरिकन दिस पार्टनरशिप विच आई टॉक अबाउट द एलाइज दैट आर दे आर इनडिस्पेंसिबल टू ईच अदर because the we have always spoken about the intelligence you have one person in that area who will warn you about something which will go wrong in your area that is the intelligence community now imagine this on a full scale with the countries as persons and israel serves as american intelligence in that entire region j you pick up the map and you put it that's the only democratic state in that whole uh, zone and america has succeeded in even bringing saudi arabia to recognize israel so that's such a big uh, leap of uh, progress in, amidst this war on terror we had jordan which helped to um, stop 99% of the iranian missiles that was such a revelation he was the commanding officer for uk for britain so these kind of uh, twists and tails uh, twists in the tail are what bring us to the uh, progress that the friendships make uh, underhand we never expected saudi arabia to support israel we never expected jordan to support israel but they are and uh, though we have some state which will recognize palestine we have somebody who is right over there wanting to help israel so saudi arabia helping israel is far more important to us there rather than slovak slovakia wanting to recognize palestine so there's a difference in this balance well, let me uh, just to throw one interesting um possibility at you uh as part of that question you know the the, the trump camp would like to um, diminish uh, nato they like to throw nato out they like to cut ties with the eu um they'd like to hand over ukraine to putin or at least part of it yeah. um and i guess my my concern is if trump shoves off from europe it doesn't really work for him then to say or for the united states then to say hey you guys we want you to support israel because they they're not going to be happy with our leadership and if we ask them to support a country you know Uh, outside of europe they're not going to be inclined to do that they're not going to be inclined to take our advice is what i'm saying your thoughts about that if trump wins he can support i don't know exactly how he will do that but he can support israel but uh, if he shoves off from the eu uh, will the eu uh, shove off from israel yeah j uh, there is uh, this kind of uh... attitude that trump has uh, that he wants to go for the photo ops as soon as he comes into power and he wants it to be a lovey dovey world of politics when he comes into power there is no war there is nothing and uh, you see he is extremely uh, aggressive in nature there is this story if i can tell you that he was at the taliban uh, uh, conference and he told the taliban people that not even one uh us citizen should be harmed when i'm going out when we are coming out of afghanistan and otherwise i'll kill you so the translator got scared to put this to the taliban leader he said i'm not going to translate so trump walks up to the taliban leader and he shows him a photograph of his house and he says this i will target if you harm so he's got that kind of madness uh, the streak of madness and he doesn't understand he who he is facing he will just do what his mind tells him and nato gone climate change gone um uh what do you say uh europe not listening to the us he doesn't care that 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 kind of attitude that he has to not care about what the world thinks is what is what what, what is going to make the world a very different situation if he wins <laughs> it's going to be absolutely chaotic and uh, a different situation i mean it's really going to change world politics from what it is now yes indeed god knows how these changes <laughs> will unfold we can't, we can't really anticipate them we will try to cover them 
But for now, we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. Thank you so much. Aloha, Jay. Thank you.